works, it works. And so we're going to keep leaning into the fact that it works. We're going to be reading out of Acts chapter 13, verses 27 through 30. I'm so glad we get to serve a God who thought enough to give us his word. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Acts chapter 13, verses 27 through 30. You know, as we study through the book of Acts, it's the early works of the church and the establishing things that Jesus did to lay the foundation to get to us to where we are today. And so it's always important to look back at what was going on and to understand the origins of our family. And so in Acts chapter 13, we have Paul traveling and he's going through and he's now in Jerusalem. And they've said that he's been talking about some stuff here and there. He showed up to the temple in the synagogue. He said he listened to the things that they were teaching. And then they said, hey, Paul, you got something to say? And Paul said, absolutely. And so here we have in the midst of his sermon and his explanation, Paul decided to share about Jesus while also telling them about themselves. Acts chapter 13, verses 27 through 30 says, for those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, Jesus, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now, when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree, laid him in a tomb, but God raised him from the dead. Yeah. Amen? Y'all, yeah. it's important for us to make sure that we get right, stay right, and be right. I want you guys just take your seat, turn to somebody and say, get right. Be right, be right and stay right. stay right. All right. So we got a problem here in Acts chapter 13 because Paul is talking to the people he's talking about. Acts wasn't written when Paul was saying this. This is a recording of what Paul had to say. And when they said, Paul, do you have anything you want to add? We've read all the law and the prophets again because it's the Sabbath. It's Sunday. We've come and we've read the scriptures. Paul, we've heard about you traveling around. Do you want to tell us anything about the way you're talking about? And he says, yes, absolutely. Because, you know, Plato said, a wise person knows when to say something and so does a fool. And so Paul said, I'm wise enough to say something when I got the opportunity to say and the thing that he does is he takes the same things that they have been working through, reading over and over again, and he teaches them about the reality that they are part of the lived out prophecies they've been studying. He says, I'm going to take you back all the way to when we were in Egypt, and then we got out of Egypt, and then God dealt with us in the wilderness, and then he put us into the promised land, and then he ruled us by prophets. And then the prophets kept prophesying about this Messiah who would ultimately come, not just save us from Egypt, but save us from ourselves. He then says, but prophets weren't good enough because you remember us, we the people, we wanted a king like everybody else. Yes, we are peculiar people. Yes, God set us aside, but the problem was we wanted to be like everybody else. And so we said, God, please give us a king. And God said, that's what you want? Fine, that's what you get. So what king did they get? They got Saul, a hot mess of a man. Saul, who was so pompous and jealous. Saul, who was paranoid that people were coming after him and he wanted to kill David. Saul, who could only be eased in the midst of his mental struggles and his paranoia by the music that David played. The same man he wanted to kill, his son's best friend. But then God saw fit to give us David and David became king. And it's through the line of David, because Paul is setting up the scene for them. It's through the line of David that we then have this man named Jesus that came down. Jesus is the son of, on the lineage of David, the king, but he's also in an anointed role, the prophet. And so while we struggle with God, I want you to lead me, God, I want my people to lead me, God says, I'm actually going to give you both. And so God solves an issue by presenting Jesus Christ. And Paul is now saying, but Jesus came. The Old Testament prophesies about Jesus hundreds of times. Y'all study it. He says, very simple, very clearly, for those who dwell in Jerusalem, that's who he's talking to and their rulers. He says, y'all heard about it and you actually taught about it and you would come to the synagogue and pontificate about it every single day. And then when he came, y'all decided to kill him. Now, this is an interesting dynamic because this isn't just any city, y'all. This is Jerusalem. 
This is not Sodom and Gomorrah. This is Jerusalem. This ain't Rocky Mount, Tarboro, Kanita. This is Jerusalem. Now, you may say, well, Jerusalem, what's so special about it? Jerusalem is named the city of God. Jerusalem is this nation that says, in God we trust. Jerusalem is this nation that proclaims over and over again that we don't only bow down to people, we bow down to God. And if anybody steps in here trying to go against God, we're going to kill them because you don't blaspheme our God in our city. Now take note, they're willing to kill the person who blasphemes against God, but they also took the steps to kill God. How often do we get into the wrong places, y'all? How often do we get into the wrong mindset? The reality is that we need the right people in the right place. Jerusalem was the right place. The people were wrong. And oftentimes in our situations, we have the right place, but we with the wrong people. We are the wrong people. So often we then run away from what is a right place saying that place is no good, but we're the problem with the place. I want us to understand that Jerusalem was not only the city of God, it was a place where God put his name, the place of salvation, the throne of God, the holy city. And Jerusalem is going to be made new. Jerusalem is so special that God says, I'm going to redeem it and restore it. And then in heaven, there will be a new Jerusalem. So the issue is not the place. The issue is the people. The people there miss the mark. Imagine, just imagine it, showing up every Sunday, showing up every Tuesday, talking about how God moves and talking about how God is the greatest power and singing about amazing grace and never accepting the grace. Imagine proclaiming that you believe that God is able to deliver, but you decide to stay chained to the things that bound you for generations. Imagine showing up to the hospital where they can help you, but refusing care because you can do it on your own. Imagine it. Why be in the right place, but be the wrong person? We need to get right. And I want to be very clear. This doesn't mean get perfect. This means get better. This means lean into sanctification. This means actually relieve the things we're reading. I would imagine because even after Jesus was killed, this is Jerusalem. This is the Jerusalem. Remember back in the day when Jesus came in with his family, he was 12 years old. They did a pilgrimage pilgrimage and visited some family at the Passover. Then his family was traveling. No, it's not just, it wasn't just Joseph and Mary. They weren't neglectful parents. It was a whole caravan of folks. A couple of days later, they realized, now, wait a second. I ain't seen my child in a long time. Had to take a couple of days journey back and found Jesus, the God that has been prophesied about talking to the people in the temple about the prophecies of himself. They sitting there listening to it, seeing God talk about himself, pointing it out in scriptures who he is, and yet they still rejected him later on in life. Years of exposure, years of discussion, Years of gospel presentation, years of grandpa and grandma praying, years of showing up, years of making sure you get to church because you got to feel good about the week, and years of being stuck in the same dead place. This is an issue of malpractice and misuse of scripture. And unfortunately, we see the power of engaging with scripture being completely wasted on a group of people who want to show up but don't want God to show out. We see the fact that they had all that they needed in the scriptures and they read it every single week, yet they never truly uh, believed it and applied it. We need to understand that today's Jerusalem is the church. Today's Jerusalem is your house. Today's Jerusalem is your marriage. Today's Jerusalem is your friendship. Today's Jerusalem is anywhere that God exists and wants you to believe in his working power in that space. And so I don't want us to get disconnected like, dang, that's crazy, Jerusalem. They wild over there. No, think about Word Tabernacle Church. We've been around for 18 years. And you ain't got to put your business out there. But I want you to think on that thing. How many sermons have you sat and been amazed by, walked out and never actually put any faith application in the content? 
I want you to think about the fact that I, I, I didn't grow up in church. I went to church when I was little till five, and then my Aunt Dale, hey, Aunt Leonard right there. Mama put me in church at Faith, Hope, and Charity. Aunt Dale, we had the house church, and I was visiting. I memorized the scriptures and stuff, but I didn't grow up in church. But I do remember being exposed to the church. And I do remember not believing the things of the church. And I remember when I was in youth ministry and I was going for a while. And one day, on one Sunday, the pastor was preaching. And for some reason, all of a sudden, stuff started clicking. All of a sudden, my, my knees got a little shaky. My hands got a little sweaty. And I said, there's a difference in what I'm hearing today. And I remember as a youth, I had already joined the church. I had already been baptized. I was already a leader in the church. But it was in that moment, I said, yo, I'm not actually saved. I was just coming but I was in the right place, but I was the wrong person. My heart wasn't open to it. And I want us to understand, it is important, it is imperative. Jesus is gonna be wherever you are. You just need to be in the space with him. Jesus is in Jerusalem. We are studying Jesus. Do you look at him as a historic figure and leave it there, or do you see him as a savior, divine and able and willing and here for you? You got to be in the right place, but you also got to be the right person. We need to get right, y'all. The next thing is that it's great to be the right person, but you also need the right things in the right heart. You need the right things in the right heart. You can have the right things, but the wrong heart. You can have a good friend, but you be a horrible person and waste all the goodness of that friend. You can have a good job, get some good money, and then be in complete bad debt because you don't know how to manage it. You can be a person who has gone to school every single day, go all the way through 13th grade at early college, and flunk out because you chose not to use the right things. The heart issue here is imperative. Again, they were in the right city. They were studying the right scripture, but they didn't actually utilize a good heart to employ them. Verse 27 says, they did not know him, nor even the voice, or even the voices of the prophets, which they read every Sabbath. They were so religious that when God himself showed up, they couldn't recognize him. They were so used to studying scripture as if it was an academic exercise, they didn't see the spiritual power in the living word of God. They were so used to waking up, reading five minutes, closing the Bible and moving on and saying, yes, I had a devotion, checking off the right things, but not having the right heart to let it settle and meditate and actually process through. What did that scripture teach me? They were so used to doing the spiritual disciplines, but without the heart. And they're like, well, I'm giving. Why am I not getting that pressed down, shaking together and running over? You know, I, I'm loving my enemies or trying my best. Why do I not have what I want in relationships? I am trying. The issue is good efforts with a bad heart relates to nothing. A positive plus a negative equals a negative. A positive times a negative equals a negative. There's no, that's math. That, that's life. I can say, I love you, punch you in the throat. Positive times a negative is negative. And oftentimes what we do is we take spiritual disciplines of going to church and gathering with the body of believers and studying scripture and, and doing the words of prayer. But when you don't have the heart, the faith, and the desire to actually utilize them and give a space for it, it breeds nothing. And then we say, God, you're the one who's not faithful. I want to say, God says, I'm here for you, but here's the deal. Your heart is concrete. I got some seeds I want to plant in you. I want you to be good ground, but you have plowed over all things and, and left a rock stone heart. The only thing that can break that up is to actually believe, confess your sins, repent, and follow me. That's how you break down the heart, the stone heart, so that God can then use it to cultivate it and plant seeds that will grow up into what you're actually saying you desire. That is how it works. I want you to think about it. It, is, it may sound complicated, but it's not. It really comes down to a place of faith. An awareness in your head versus a covenant belief in your heart. And I know that can sound real churchy and religious. You're like, oh, what does that mean? I want you to think about it. If someone decided they wanted to marry you, I'm married. 
She home with the babies. They sick. A little cough, cough. But listen, she said yes. Some of y'all were in there when she said yes. She said yes. My commitment to my marriage was not someone I just want to hang out with. And I'm not sure if you've ever been in a relationship with a person who you know they're not really there for you or with you. And you could be all in with them. But when you see that they don't really want you, all of a sudden your emotions just turn gray. All of a sudden you're like, oh, I oh. All of a sudden, you want to call them, you want to talk to them, you want to text them, but they never text back, they never call back. You in the cafeteria, you want to sit with them, but you realize that they're going to sit with their other friends, their other girl, their other boy. And all of a sudden, you realize it's not that I have changed, it's that I'm now aware of what you actually feel about me. And God is a very loving God. He's a very gracious God, but he also is a God of accountability. And he says, I'm a jealous God. And if you're going to be with me, I need your heart with me. I appreciate you showing up to the house. I appreciate you showing up and bringing a little thing. He even says, all these offerings that you bring me, dung, noise, clanging cymbals, none of it matters if your heart isn't there. He says, I see the spiritual discipline. I see the sacrifice. I see all that. But you know what? Obedience is better than sacrifice. I see all of that. But you know what? You are prophesying and you're being effective in your ministry, but your heart ain't right because I see you really don't believe and you really don't want me. You just want the benefits of being around me. And you know what? Because of that, I'm cutting off my blessings. Because of that, I'm cutting off my access. And when you call my name, I'm not answering. Why? Because the people I answer are my children and my family. God is a gracious God. I mean, and I try my best. Listen, I love the babies. I love the folks. But listen, I got three children, Kendall, Olivia, and Emery. Those are the three people I'm legally bound to take care of. If you show up to my house saying you're hungry, you might get a meal. If another person shows up, they might get a meal, especially if they're connected to one of my children. But what I'm not is... Is legally obligated to take care of you. So if you send your kids to my house, by all means, the Jesus send me may say, come on in, have a seat, kick up your feet, let's have a good time, but you have got to go home because my three children need to go to sleep. And I want us to understand, that's not God being mean, that's God being real because he's laid out all of the explanations, he's laid out all of the circumstances, if you believe, if you follow, if you obey, then I will do these things. And when we show up, we show up to Jerusalem, we show up using spiritual distance saying, Father, Daddy, he says, you're not my kid. And some of us are not listening to him. Some of us are ignoring him. And we're going to get to the point of judgment day where he says, I told you I never knew you. Depart. And we act like God is the mean one. But here we are down here on earth. We won't even take that mess from somebody we knew 15 years. We cut people off quick. But we demand that God give us everything we want, when we want, how we want. I will ignore you all my life, but when I have an emergency, I'm popping up in prayer. Give me God, help me God. And in his grace, he might. In his grace, some of us get blessings because we're attached to his children. But ultimately, I want us to be very clear about something. The promises he gives is not to just anybody. The promises he gives are to the people who believe him, the people who love him, the people who have faith in him. It's very clear. So we can have the right things, but without the right heart, we have nothing. We have nothing. So those of us with the right heart, I need us to start embracing the spiritual disciplines. You got the right heart, and you're wondering, why can't I hear from God? You saved. It's sincere. You win there. And that's between you and God. I'm not a salvation inspector. Amen? I'm not coming around saying your answer wasn't, your prayer wasn't answered because of this, that, and the other. That's between you and the Lord. Amen? I know he my daddy. I hope he yours. But what we also need to do is if we are his child, it doesn't make sense for us to sit starving, sitting at the table of our father. It doesn't make sense for us to be stranded when we can call daddy and say, come pick me up. It doesn't make sense. I would be heartbroken. It didn't even happen. I'm upset. I would be heartbroken if any of my children were in distress and they refused to call me. I would be distraught 
knowing I have the resources and the will to do the work for my child. But in the midst of that, my child simply refuses to ask. My child simply refuses to show up. God says very clearly, these people in Jerusalem, they were doing the spiritual disciplines. They were reading every single Sabbath, all the prophecies. They were following all these rules. And the kids who aren't even connected to God sometimes are more religious than those who are. Let us not wallow in grace while neglecting and ignoring the things that he wants us to grow up in. So I want you to think through what spiritual discipline am I not utilizing with my father? Is it prayer? Is it meditating on his word while I read something and I hyper focus on what that message, what that scripture is saying? Is it that, is it giving? Because I t- my father told me he will provide for me, but I'm afraid that if I give up this, my daddy won't have enough to give me more. I want us to think, what spiritual discipline, what right things are you neglecting when you are a child who is an inheritor of all the blessings? The last point I'm going to make, we need to have the right purpose at the right time. So one, we need the right people in the right place. We need the right things in the right heart, but we also need the right purpose at the right time. (laughs) Y'all. Purpose is something I think oftentimes is overused and misunderstood. What is my purpose in life? What am I supposed to do? God has purposed me to do this. God is creating purpose. It's very, very simple. One, your number one purpose that God has given everyone is that he wills for all to be saved. So that means your number one purpose is to be in relationship with him. He created us way back when. He created humanity and designed us to be in relationship with him without anything blocking us, without any hindrances. He says, I'm yours and you are mine. So our first purpose, and that's why everyone on earth, every society has some form of people, some form of system where they're trying their best to get connected to a higher power. That's because we were designed to be in relationship with the highest power. We were designed to be known by God and to know him ourselves. But outside of that purpose of being related to God, connected to God, we are purpose for other things. Verse 28 says, and though they found no cause for death in him, these folks are crazy. Though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now, when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree, laid him in the tomb, but God raised him from the dead. I love the way Paul is saying this. Paul is saying, you know what? It was an okie doke because you, God said, I want this, 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 this to happen. And he said, so after they did all that stuff that God wanted them to do, they took him down. But if you look from the other perspective, they'll say, ha ha, we killed Jesus. We did the things we want to do. And the whole while God said, that is exactly what I needed to happen. Have you ever had a person who thought they were getting over on you? (laughs) For some reason, they thought they were wiser, smarter, more skilled. And you looked at that fool in the face and you said, I know I've heard it all before. That's what Sunshine Anderson said, right? I heard it all before. And they look who's hurting now, all right? It's very simple. I want us to understand. Jesus wasn't shook or shocked by the pain he was experiencing, and God wasn't given an okie doke. So I want us to understand. Paul is saying to the same people who did it, when y'all finished being trifling and attacking him, even though you knew he was innocent because you a liar, you found no fault in him, but you still wanted him to be killed. After y'all did all that, and you fulfill what God said was going to happen in the first place, you took him down from the tree, put him in the grave, because he was dead. All right? But I like to see it wasn't really death. It was more so a season of deadly transition that led to resurrected life. Amen? So it says, because, verse 30, but God raised him from the dead. And you know what? You can be dead, dead. But because the name of Jesus has power, in your dead, dead state, God gives you life, life, right? And not only does he start it, he keeps it going for eternity, okay? So believer, you are in the right place. You are in the right place. You're like, man, this, I'm in the right place. I know I'm with the right person. That's my boo, that's my bae, that's my wife. The covenant has started. I'm not breaking that up. I know I'm in the right place. I'm in the church. I know I'm in the right place. I'm where God has called me to be in my employment. I know I'm in the right place. I have a parent relationship, a friendship relationship, but the struggle is I'm struggling in the midst of this right now. I realize that, yeah, I have parents, but you know what? The struggle is that one day my parents are going to die. 
Okay, I realize that yes, I'm in, I'm married, but there's gonna be some struggles in the midst of this relationship. Yes, God provided the job for me, but listen, inflation happened. The bills don't match the pay anymore. And I want us to understand there's gonna be circumstances and situations where you're gonna feel like you've lost. You're gonna feel like you're dying or dead. You're gonna feel overwhelmed. It is human nature. And I want us to understand in the midst of all of those things, it all works together for your good. And I know this, this is going to hurt. This is, this is not a comfortable thing. Sometimes the working together for your good is they tried to play you, but because y'all broke up, you found somebody better. You're like, oh, it worked together for my good. So I'm glad that you cheated on me because now I found someone faithful. But listen, sometimes the work together for my good is I'm in the hospital and I don't see how I'm going to make it out. And then a miracle happens that's unexplainable. And you realize this whole season of what I thought was death is actually just a testimony of how God is a healer. And you can say, I see the purpose in that. The purpose, I see. I was going through that struggle so I could have a testimony, so I can give glory to God, so other people who were going through it, I can encourage them. That's why the cancer was there, but it's gone now. I see what that was. But friends, here's the thing that is painful for us. Sometimes we're in this situation and it doesn't change on earth. We oftentimes misuse, and not to our fault, but just sometimes it's confusing, this idea that it all works together for my good. When Paul wrote that in Philippians, he was not saying it's going to work out great and everything's going to be okay. He was saying, I'll die, but if I die, I'll go to heaven. I win. He says, I'm in pain, and if God decides to answer when I call his name and change it here, hmm, I win. Either way, my death is a win-win situation. Because while they hung me on the tree, while they put me in the grave, God is the one who's going to raise me up from the dead. And so whether on earth I see an outcome that is pleasing to my flesh or in heaven I see an outcome that is satisfying to my soul, I'm winning. My God has kept his promise that in the end it all works together for my good. And a lot of times we don't like to praise and think because even in the midst of the diagnosis, even in the midst when you have one week left of life, even in the midst where there seems no hope, I do understand the hope and belief that God can work miracles, but even in the midst of that, Christians do not like to realize that we will all die. Christians, we don't like to realize that our Father takes care of us, but he ain't going to make everything easy for us. Christians, it is hard for us to give a testimony to somebody. Ain't that the, you said his name word. You would call his name on that situation. And I took note that it ain't changed. I took note that you're still down. I took note that you got lower than you were before. We don't like to say, but it's cool because all works together for my good. In that moment, we say, oh, you're right. I don't know what's going on. I lost my faith. I'm walking away. I want us to stand firm in that thing. My God is my God. His will be done. And here's the deal, that is not an easy thing to get to. That's something that's difficult to get to, but that's also something that the right heart can accept because as I've been processing and reading and praying, God has changed my will to his. As I've been processing and reading and praying, I'm having a, a, a Paul situation. Whether I be poor or rich, I'm content. Whether I be shipwrecked on a cruise, I'm, I'm content. Whether I be at home or in jail, I'm content. I'm hungry, I'm starving, or I got feast on, I'm on days, I'm content. And sometimes it's like, how you get there? It's super simple. The right place Place, the right person, the right heart, the right things, and the right purpose. It's that simple. We got to get right, be right, and stay right. And the reality is every single one of us are going to have trials and tribulations that we are not able to deal with in our physical and social world. I need you to get right so that you can be able to process through it. And if God works a miracle on earth, praise be to God. And if nothing else happens on earth, then the miracle is that you and your stanky, dirty, sinful soul that got cleaned up, saved, and seen him in heaven, praise be to God. Because that's that's a bigger miracle than him fixing my leg. That's a bigger miracle than him providing some finances. That's a bigger miracle than him changing anything I've asked for. We need to understand the miracle is in salvation. The miracle is the fact that he died and he got up. The miracle is in the fact that he is God and he still wants to be with us. That is the miracle. He makes us right. He cleans us. He forgives us. And he got the nerve to not just cover up our sin. He wipes it away. 
Imagine a God who has given you every sense of possible warning and we in our ridiculousness decide to stay in that stuff and even in the midst of that, he keeps calling us and beckoning us, come to me, come to me, come to me. And we keep saying not yet or straight up no. Imagine that same God still waiting for your heart to be broken down through repentance. So he says, once you repent, once you say I'll come back, I will meet you. You are the prodigal son, but I will meet you on the road. I love you and you are still my child. He still say, I want to adopt you into my family. Yes, you showed up wanting food. Yes, you showed up wanting shelter. But it's I'm not promising you that, but if you let me adopt you into the family, I will guarantee I got you. I will guarantee I got you. And we do not know how much time we have left. The interesting thing about purpose is Jesus says he knew the time has not come, the time has not come, the time has not come. I'm not doing nothing until my time has come, right? But we also know that there's another time that we don't know. There's another time that Jesus says, even I don't know. Only the Father knows the day and the time that he's coming back. And we don't know if we have one more day of life. We don't know if we have 10 more days. We don't know if we have 10 more years before he comes back. We don't know, but he says, as long as you got breath in your lungs, I got you. And we cannot be overwhelmed that our purpose doesn't seem to be fulfilled in the timeline that we've created. Instead, we need to lean into whatever timeline God is allowing through his will. Timing matters. Timing matters. And we know that we got seven days, but one day will be a day too late. Because timing matters. We know that Jesus says, I love you and I want you, but if you don't respond to me, that's on you. Because when it's time to go, it's time to go. Timing matters. And it might be time for you to stop letting the enemy use you. It might be time for you to stop letting the enemy confuse you. It might be time for you to say, I just want to be free. I want to be free from the things that I thought that I wanted. I want to be free from the things that go against my purpose in God because I was created to worship you. I was created to know you. I was created to be known by you. And so God, if there's anything that's stopping that purpose from being fulfilled, this is the moment where I'm, I'm letting go of that stuff. This is the moment where I'm saying, God, break up my concrete heart. David said, search my heart, oh God. Search my heart, oh God. And show me the things that I need to let go of. Search my heart, God. May we as believers be the type of people when we ask God to search our heart. We believe in his findings.